Um, with that, uh, with these insights, we will move into the topic of uh, wastewater treatment and water use. Uh, we are having three people that I would uh, enjoy moderating their, their, their talks. Uh, Marcos Perez from TIPSA, Valentina Lazarova from Water Globe Consultants, and uh, Joseph Cortuvo from Joseph Cortuvo and Associates. We were supposed to have uh, a fourth person, a lady from uh, uh, from uh, the UK. Unfortunately, uh, she couldn't make it. This is uh, uh, Miss Elizabeth Court is not with us. Personally, as a moderator, I very much wanted her to be in because uh, uh, in our narrative we had this uh, piece of news that 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 made it through the the media a couple of months ago that the uh, Europe, the, the UK Environmental Agency placed a huge focus on the remaining pollutants and contaminants in uh, wastewater that somehow doesn't make it through the wastewater treatment plants in the UK, but uh, through uh, sewer overflows and through other methods, uh, or even when it goes through wastewater treatment plants, it doesn't uh, get sufficiently treated. But anyway, I believe that uh, in the context of our talks today, wastewater treatment is a huge topic, uh, technologically, uh, operationally, etc. And this is a topic where uh, we reach the more practical areas of uh, urban and rural water supply, uh, sanitation, treatment, and this uh, more engineering and more operations topics. I would like to first give the floor to Mr. Marcos Perez, who uh, has substantial experience in uh, building, operating, optimizing treatment plants. Um, in uh, Spain and globally, uh, and his particular focus is wastewater treatment for the sake of uh, uh, making it uh, feasible for irrigation. Uh, Marcos, I would appreciate a bit of an introduction to give us your angle to the topic and then to jump into your presentation. Thank you. Right now, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation for this event. Um, okay, uh, I'm, I've been working for uh, as a project manager for uh, this company. It's a Spanish engineering company. Here, uh, I am located at the Murcia Regional Office. Uh, Murcia is a region in Spain, uh, in the Mediterranean coast of Spain. Okay. And uh, we we have a project. Uh, we've been running this project uh, for for Esamur, which is the regional agency uh, for wastewater treatment in this region, and uh, for the last almost 20 years. So we've been focusing on treated wastewater reuse because this is a, this is a region where agriculture is a very important uh, economic uh, activity for uh, international and, and national markets, okay? So I would like to give you a view of, um, of uh, how, uh, a view of the situation of treated wastewater we use here in this uh, region, because we are quite proud of what uh, we have achieved uh, during these last uh, 20 years, right? Uh, if you like, I can share the presentation. Please. Uh, okay. Let me see if I can do that. I have the permission to do so. Okay. If not, give a shout. I should share the application or the screen, or I'm not screen. sure. Screen. Okay. Screen, right? Share your screen, yes, and make sure that your presentation is open to. Okay, okay. Comment. Hold on a second, I'll do that. If you have a, if you have any troubles, I can assist with sharing your presentation, and you can navigate me to change slides. Is this working for you? Uh, let, let me see. I think. Ah, yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Let me see if I can find the presentation. I don't know if you can see the presentation now. Perfectly, thank you. Great. Okay, so I'm going to give you a view of uh, what the situation of um, treated with water reuse or reclaim reclaim water for crop irrigation here in this uh, in this uh, region. Um, as you can see, is uh, we are located at the Mediterranean coast. Um, we have a very low average uh, rainfall in in this uh, region, like 350 millimeters per year, and we are a major producer of, um, of fruits and vegetables for the domestic uh, market and, and for abroad. Okay, so we need uh, we need uh, water. Uh, we are 1.5 million inhabitants. We have uh, wastewater treatment plants, uh, almost 100 wastewater treatment plants of different sizes, of course, for, from 100 uh, cubic meters, 100,000 cubic meters a day to, to very small wastewater treatment plants like 100 cubic meters a day. The population served right now is uh, almost 100 percent, and the percent reuse is almost 100% also, 98%. Um, of this, of, of this uh, is, um, we have a direct re reuse, 56%, and indirect re reuse, uh, 42%. Um, and this uh, accounts for the 15% of the total needs of the region for for crop irrigation, you can see here in um, in this picture here uh, the usual system for um, for the reuse of the treated wastewater. This is uh, the wastewater treatment plant, and then we have uh, reservoirs for the um, for the treated water to be uh, sent to the to the farmers. We have the a whole distribution system. Okay, here if there is another plant and, and we have the reservoir here and from here is uh, distributed to, to the farmers, to the local farmers. Uh, we are following here multi multiple barrier approach. Uh, our goal is, uh, of course, safeguard public health and trying to cut off the flow of pathogens through multiple barriers. Okay, so in the wastewater treatment plants we have, uh, of course, several treatment processes in series, primary treatment, secondary treatment, and tertiary treatments. Uh, I must say that most of the wastewater treatment plants, um, all of the most important ones, have uh, already tertiary treatments. And then we have other barriers, uh, like uh, microbiological microbi water quality according to the intended use. We'll see this now. Uh, different irrigation techniques uh, to limit human exposure uh, for workers and for consumers also. Uh, right now we are following the, um, the Spanish regulation for uh, treated with water reuse, which is um, this regulation comes from, um, it started in 2007. And now there is a new, uh, there was, uh, up to now, there was no regulation for uh, treated with water reuse in Europe. But uh, in 2020, um, a regulation was approved for, uh, for a minimum requirements for water reuse, okay, for agricultural irrigation. We are trying to comply already with this, uh, with this European regulation and we are, uh, for most of the plants, we we can achieve that. It's more restrictive, more stringent than the the Spanish regulation. Okay, so you see, 
according to the intended use of the water, we will have a quality of, um, of the treated wastewater that we need. Uh, in this case, this is the most uh, stringent uh, uh, agricultural use where the water uh, comes into direct contact with edible parts. And we had this limit, 100. I'm focusing on microbiological um, quality uh, because we don't have any problem with uh, chem physical chemical uh, quality. Um, and this is 100 uh, colonies per 100 milliliters in this uh, Spanish regulation of E. coli. The new regulation in Europe that uh, was approved, as I was telling before, uh, was approved in 2020, but it will apply uh, next year. Uh, it, 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 it follows the same approach uh, according to the intended use of uh, the reclaimed water. Okay, so we have the most stringent uh, limit here is um, lower than, must be lower or equal to 10 colonies of uh, E. coli for the microbiological quality of the, of the treated wastewater. And uh, besides that, we have to follow a, val a validation. Uh, you have to, we have to go through a validation of the systems that we have uh, that we have in our uh, plants, uh, especially for the new systems. And uh, it consists on uh, achieving these performance targets, performance targets uh, in uh, E. coli viruses and clostridium perfringens uh, spores and also risk assessment is required uh, assessment of risk to the environment and to human and animal uh, health taking into account the nature of the identified potential hazard so right now uh, for you to have an idea of what we are doing here uh, to control the performance of the of the plants we have this uh, magnitude of work uh, per year more almost uh, 1500 technical visits uh, uh, 3800 water line samples sludge, sludge line samples etc microbiological samples every every year right uh, the most common tertiary treatments that we have are uh, physicochemical processes, lamella settlers, filtration, different type of filtrations, very important. UV system for disinfection, most of the disinfection is done with UV systems, also some with chlorine and uh, ultrafiltration membranes. Our current challenges in water reuse, uh, improve uh, treatments, reliability and efficiency, ensure food safety, of course, with affordable uh, treatments and the implementation of risk management systems according to regulation, um, the new regulation in Europe. Uh, we, we for, to, to achieve all this, uh, we, for, to, to get the maximum reliability of the facilities, we follow a very strict maintenance. We have installed a lot of online sensors and analyzers um, with alarms in case uh, there is any problem. Uh, we are trying to, uh, we are testing some, some fast detection the systems, uh, fast detection, uh, I mean, fast, uh, the, the fast detection of pathogens uh, systems, which is, uh, we, are, we are trying to install some, some of them and uh, have a real time uh, information about, uh, uh, assist, uh, about uh, pathogen concentration in the, in the effluents. Uh, we we run a lot of tests uh, to 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 maximum to maximize our knowledge of the plants, right? Like particle uh, size and distribution uh, distribution studies, CFD studies, uh, chlorine demand tests, also for the UV systems, uh, collimated uh, being assay assays, and uh, we are testing different treatments to improve efficiency and safety uh, like uh, ozone we are trying uh, ozone systems uh, other chemicals other than chlorine for example for disinfection for example pyracetic uh, acid uh, 
and we have already installed some full-scale ultrafiltration ultra plants. Uh, we've seen so far that um, the tested treatments is not so effective uh, for clostridium perfringens uh, spores are chlorine compounds, UV at low dosages and microfiltration. But very effective tested treatments are UV at high dose, ultrafiltration, and ozone at uh, also high dosages. And we are cur working currently on, uh, for, for the full scale facilities, we are currently working on increasing UV dose, always having in mind the new, EU, e, the new uh, uh, European um, uh, legislation, right? Increasing UV dose and uh, installing new ultrafiltration membranes, membrane systems. And we are also testing treatments for emerging compounds with activated carbon and ozone. We have some full-scale uh, systems already uh, in place with, uh, with activated carbon. We've seen that it's very effective, uh, removing a lot of emerging compounds. But uh, we've seen also that after four or five months, it goes from 80% of uh, removal of the, uh, the main emerging compounds to 20% removal. So we need to uh, regenerate this, uh, the, this, uh, this activated carbon uh, around uh, four months, after four months of uh, performance. So it can be quite expensive. So just to finish, uh, the current situation on water reuse here in this region, of course, is not the same in the whole of Spain. Uh, in, Mur in the Murcia region, is a lot of experience on. We have a lot of experience on water reuse. Uh, water reuse, uh, we've seen that is very safe uh, with all, with good practices. Uh, the new European uh, regulation will increase safety for sure, and um, we follow the precautionary principle with a multi-barrier approach, a lot of monitoring and control that will increase safety and confidence. Um, thank you very much. This is uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the practical insights on how to treat water so it's good for irrigation. I believe your country and your region and probably your, co your company is one of the leaders in that uh, based on the reasons that you said in the beginning, uh, that you live in dry conditions and you need water for irrigation. There's one good question coming to you, but I will keep it to the end in the, uh, for, for, in the interest of time. Uh, yes. So, Marcos, stay around <laughs> because yeah, sure. no problem. Uh, we will have something to ask you. With that, I would like to, 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 to move to our next speaker, our next panelist, who is uh, Dr. Valentina Lazarova, who will, uh, who is kind of, uh, bridging um, research and uh, implementation work on uh, on water is used and with a particular angle on the biotechnologies and their role. Uh, she has uh, quite substantial experience both in research, both in big environmental companies, also uh, chairing the water reuse group in the International Water Association for some time. So uh, a real pleasure to have you with us, Valentina. Uh, over to you and thank you. Thank you, Rado, for this introduction. I'm very sorry because I am in very tough conditions. They are works. I have no heading. I have no internet. But uh, we, in, uh, I cannot sh share my screen. But with uh, uh, your help, uh, so we will do the, my presentation. I'm very pleased, uh, you know, to talk because biotechnology is my first love in uh, my career in uh, wastewater treatment and I think that in the frame of uh, water polishing and water reuse is very, very important. The next slide, please. Well, uh, first of all, I, I would like to bring uh, the definition of water use, which is <clears throat> uh, well defined in the ISO. 
2016-17. This is the use of treated wastewater for beneficial use, which means that we need to adapt uh, the water, treated water quality to the different uses. Uh, in uh, almost in all regulation, except in Mexico, uh, well, um, the secondary wastewater treatment is mandatory. It's necessary, it's mandatory. The secondary one, the biological one. For this reason, the bio, biotechnology is very important. So we have a different kind um, of, um, you know, uses, agriculture, Marcos uh, developed this, urban uses, industrial. And uh, after that, uh, the uh, portable reuse, we have now direct portable reuse um, projects. And so for this, we need to, to remove almost all the constituents. The next one. Well, if we look, uh, as you said, in the upper circle, we um, we have uh, the different kind of, a, uh, of reuse. The next slide. So we need to start step by step. The first step is primary treatment to remove uh, some grid. The second one is the biological step, secondary biological treatment, which is extremely important. We are using the very common te technology is activated sludge, biofiltration. Well, the oldest simplest technology is trinkling filters, is also biofilm reactors. In more um, recent development, which is uh, membrane bioreactors, in a uh, different combination of different technology to guarantee energy positive uh, plants. The next one. The next step is filtration because before to go uh, for uh, disinfection, as Marcus showed, we need to, to remove almost all suspended solids, to remove all the um, uh, pathogens or, or uh, bacterial indicators. We need to, to, to target almost zero suspended solids for this reason. We have um, different kinds of media filtration, cold filtration, mechanical filter, and so on, before to go the next uh, next slide to disinfection. So disinfection, as uh, uh, we heard, is we have chlorination, which is still the most uh, uh, used technology word line. Uh, UV technology uh, also is uh, uh, has a very very high uh, implementation. is very mature technology. Uh, ozonation is um, excellent technology. We have a good experience in France. And after that, we can do use um, different kind of water um, disinfectant, parasitic acid, formic acid, uh, electrochlorination. Uh, so on to to comply with uh, the regulations from uh, water use regulation for the instance are targeting mostly microbial removal. N the next, the next slide. If we would like to go, uh, you know, to um, uh, portable reuse, active uh, aquifer recharge, or uh, some industrial uses, you know, we need to remove uh, <clears throat> uh, also. Uh, uh, organic macro pollutants, emerging pollutants with, uh, with different technology, ozonation, activated sludge, hybrid processes, and reverse osmosis, which is also the most effective one because the membrane have a port to allowing only the mo molecules of the water to go through. So all the cells, all the macro pollutants are removed. The next one. In uh, uh, well, uh, reverse osmosis, uh, and also to remove all the salts, you know, to uh, for industrial uh, application or aquifer recharge, we have also requirements for salt removal. The the main the main technology is reverse osmosis, but also in Spain, especially they uh, they have a very good experience with electrodialysis reversals. And nano filtration can also achieve some of the target for reuse. The next one. So, uh, well, just uh, to to say a few um, few tools about uh, the technology innovation trends. First of all, we need for water reuse to improve the reliability, performance, flexibility, and robustness of existing technology. And here, the biologic treatment will play and is playing. 
yet a very good, uh, um, important role, uh, which include activated sludge processes, membrane bioreactors, biofiltration, and of course, anaerobic processes. Today, I will not talk about because in one of the um, previous uh, uh, biotech uh, atelier, you talked about this is very important for energy positive plants. Polishing step, which means um, tertiary treatment, also are very important, and we need um, we have a lot of work to do, not only to um, to have a very high efficiency, but also to have cost um, efficiency. Because if uh, you you cannot to implement, we we have uh, some economic limits. Well, um, it's very important for the new uh, technologies. Uh, to to look on the cost, energy, and efficiency because we can have excellent technology, but, but uh, if the cost is prohibitive, it's not possible to have practical uh, application everywhere. Uh, innovative tools to process the water quality monitoring. Marcus um, demonstrated this. Uh, while well, TIPS uh, developed because they have a lot of uh, European projects and they had the ability to test and to implement uh, such kind of innovation too, but we need to develop some more uh, low costly technology that can be implemented everywhere. And of course, advancing soft science and economics of water use because it's very important to have public um, you, uh, you know, acceptance and uh, water use should be cost effective. The next one. The next slide, please. So, um, well, just uh, I, I have not time to talk about all the bad technology, but I would like um, just to talk about the interdisciplinary approach to develop innovative uh, biotechnology and to optimize the existing one. The next one. Uh, just uh, here, while well, we need to have uh, different kind of steps, we need to know what is in practice, the feedback, what is existing one, well, to, to select w what processes are interesting to, to do the reactor design. Inoculation is very important because um, we are working with the living um, organism and for this reason, the help of microbiology, molecular biology is very important. And after that, uh, to implement, to develop, to optimize any biotechnology, we need um, to, well, to understand and to improve the chemistry, uh, hydrodynamics mass transfer. For this, we have uh, the um, new tools, computer fluid uh, dynamic, which is very helpful to optimize the reactor design. To, to know reactor kinetics, and of course, we need to guarantee and to test good online control because the biotechnology, as uh, the living organism are working, we need to control all the time. And for this, we have modeling, and of course, before well, to go to this uh, final step, practical application, we need to, to see the target application, the cost, and to, um, to test the scale-up. The scale-up is very important because we have a lot of innovative technology. They, they were not able to go to this step. The next one. So to illustrate this application, I would like to to uh, show first of all the very conventional technology of activated sludge and just um, why activated sludge are so effective, especially when we have uh, uh, extended aeration. So, so uh, uh, it's very important. We work it in, uh, in Suez with collaboration with the Genoscope to, to see who is working and to, um, we did uh, an excellent inventory of genomics and activated sludge. It's amazing how many, how many microbial species are working for us, over 1,000. And for this, I understood why when we apply biotechnology, they can adapt. If you guarantee a good environment condition, good hydrodynamics, especially oxygen transfer, we can teach the bacteria to remove all you want. So uh, activated sludge is the largest gen bank to date. You know, uh, and for this reason, uh, activated sludge are able to remove all uh, pollutants, all carbon pollutants, and also pharmaceuticals, a big part of pharmaceutical 
almost all antibiotics uh, to, to decrease antibiotic resistance and so on. It's excellent, so we have a lot of work to do with this technology. The next one. The next slide, please. So, if we compare this, uh, the efficiency of this technology with the new one, a membrane bioreactor, what is the difference? The membrane bioreactors is activated sludge where the settling is replaced by uh, microfiltration or ultrafiltration membrane. You see here um, ultrafiltration membrane of xenon. So, um, with this technology, we can increase the sludge con concentration. But more importantly, we can um, inc uh, increase the sludge age and so to help the bacterium to learn and to adapt to new pollutants. So, I would like to show the results of um, a big uh, French project, um, Ampere, where we monitored 1,000 priority substances and merging components to compare the um, efficiency of removal in um, Mag, uh, MBA reactor and activated sludge. The next one. If uh, here is some uh, uh, results, the blue line is membrane bioreactor and uh, mm, br um, the dark one is uh, conventional activated sludge. You see that a lot of, of emerging compounds are removed. Uh, better in uh, uh, MBR and it's normal because we have more sludge age which are allows to remove adsorbable compounds. So, in uh, also we have a very good removal of polar because we have high degradation due to the high sludge age. So, um, Biologic processes are very good barrier to, for the removal of these uh, macro, organic macropollutants and emerging substances. The next one. So, for, for few summary points for discussion, uh, well, water reuse is providing enhanced opportunity for innovation. Why? Because we need more efficient technology and lower scores and with lower energy consumptions. The new challenges is to provide, uh, well, sustainable cost and energy, energy efficient solutions to improve the role in technology. I think that we have a big room here for innovation because, for instance, biotechnology, biotechnology is the cheapest in the, this, uh, all the technology we saw previously in my third slide. And of course, to develop biotechnology, we need holistic interdisciplinary approach to uh, in um, new tools for uh, control to adapt this technology for water reuse. In order to achieve rapid practical application, is very important for this, this reason since the beginning. We need to know the practical application and the possibility of scale-up. To, t to talk about and to have good specialists. While it's very important also to guarantee easy operation and maintenance, very complicated processes such as membrane processes cannot be operated in all countries and all conditions. And of course, we need cost energy, energy effectiveness because the water, um, uh, the price of uh, water reuse of recycled water cannot be higher than the drinking water and as in all Europe and almost in all the world, the water price is uh, subsidized. So, we really, we need to have very cheap solutions. So, thank you for your attention and I'm looking for the discussion. Thanks a lot, Valentina. It was useful. Uh, please stay around for the discussion. There will be at least a couple of questions for you or at least one that I know for. Uh, I think, again, uh, one of the key points of your presentations, similar to some of the previous speakers, is the complexity and the cross-topic interdisciplinary approach that is necessary. I'm also very happy, being myself a water person, I'm very happy that you mentioned a couple of times the energy intensity and the energy efficiency aspect of, uh, of, of treatment and of uh, wastewater, so that's... Uh, also a very valid point for, for, for the whole day. With that, we would like to make a move towards uh, 
treatment of water that is suitable even for uh, potable water purposes. Our next panelist is Mr. Joseph Cortuvo. Uh, thank you for being with us, uh, Joseph. I guess we have a substantial time difference, so it's quite appreciated that uh, uh, you made it so early. Um, uh, Joseph is uh, he has substantial uh, experience in the area and uh, he has consulted a number of big organizations like the World Health Organization, the Environmental Protection Agency, etc. So that's quite a global and deep perspective. With that, I would like to pass the floor to you, Joseph, and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see the screen? And yes, we see it. You can just put it on a full screen mode. Well, I I need to look at it too. <laughs> right. So okay. okay, thank you, thank you very much. And it is early here; it's uh, quarter to six in the morning. So if I uh, doze off, uh, please forgive me. Um, well, we're going to talk about uh, broadly potable water reuse. You you've heard a number of uh, excellent presentations on detailed technologies and efficacy. I think we all agree uh, water reuse is. Uh, now becoming common, essential, very important. And it's really, uh, I think, the best opportunity to, for assuring water availability um, worldwide, ultimately. But it's going to be a while before we get there, where it's needed. Uh, just very broadly, uh, we know that uh, wastewater is 100% recyclable. Everything pretty much can be recovered and used beneficially, uh, starting with even the the uh, oils and grease. Uh, one produces soil conditioners, agricultural nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, et cetera, uh, can produce methane gas, convert that to electricity, or, or just burn it for heat, and of course, the water itself. So uh, this is a, a very essential uh, field of, of uh, development. Uh, the, there's a progression of quality needs depending on the end use. Uh, of course, cooling water is, is a possibility always. Uh, green space irrigation, non-food applications, agricultural irrigation, of course, for food crops, potable water, drinking water, and it, in the ultimate quality of water that can be produced is for the electronics industry, which is much higher quality than need then for drinking water, uh, surprisingly. And I think that's a key point. We don't have to make uh, distilled water uh, for potable applications. We need to make water that is safe and effective for its value and its and, and uh, good quality, high aesthetic quality. Well, reuse uh, has occurred forever. Uh, we know all water is always reused. And what we're trying to do with uh, process reuse is to speed up that process and produce water that is appropriate for the end use. Um, de facto potable reuse is a, a term that is uh, commonly used. Unplanned reuse, because essentially in every situation where there's a wastewater discharge, wastewater treatment plant upstream of a drinking water supply, that is a reuse application, and it's unplanned, at least originally. Uh, we know that conventional treatment accelerates the natural purification process, and so what we're trying to do is produce more water quicker. Several approaches, gener generic approaches, planned indirect potable reuse, direct potable reuse, where there is no intervening stage between the uh, treatment process and the consumer. And we know that both of these approaches can produce extremely high quality water that's potable, that's safe. And in fact, it's actually better than rainwater in most cases, uh, and better than most natural waters that are accessible. But the question is, how do you convince the public that that's true? Um, and, and the key also is that uh, these are sustainable approaches. In other words, we're, we're, we're we, we are not doing one pass water. We are using multiple pass water so that the water that is available can be uh, providing 
much more value than just one pass. Now, and by the way, it isn't always necessary to recycle water. There are plenty of places in the world where there's plenty of natural water, and so it doesn't make sense to spend a lot of money and install a lot of technology and produce recycled water. But in those many situations and those increasing numbers of situations where there is not sufficient uh, natural water available, then it is important to provide techniques for expanding the availability of the water that is available. So let's say just a few general terms that I'm sure you're all familiar with. De facto potable reuse, um, almost every surface water source is a reuse system where there's a water inflow upstream, water re removal downstream, and uh, uh, the key, of course, is that the water that's being injected upstream is properly treated so as to reduce any significant risks from downstream. Uh, uh, secondary treatment is at least is the minimum requirement before discharge, but in many cases uh, these days, tertiary treatment is also being used uh, for discharge. So that's, that's good. In influent water, better quality means better water downstream. There are plenty of natural processes that are beneficial here, which we take advantage of as, as uh, Dr. Lazarova talked about. Uh, indeed, even dilution, uh, plenty of chemical and biological activity, microbial and chemical activity, and physical removal from sedimentation and so forth. Those are all valuable parts of the total network of, of providing recycled water in the environment. In the U.S., uh, we have uh, treatment requirements for drinking water, uh, conventional drinking water treatment, uh, where the, uh, first of all, they almost be filtered. The turbidity level to be achieved is 0 0.3 NTU, uh, at least 95% of the time. And this is measured on each individual filter, not on the aggregated water. And the disinfection minimum removal requirement for conventional treatment is uh, six logs of bacteria, four logs of virus removal, and three logs of protozoan removal. That's just conventional drinking water treatment from a, a natural source. When one is dealing with planned indirect potable reuse, there will be the conventional treatment, there will be enhanced treatment, and then that product would be introduced in the environment either as a groundwater uh, percolation or injection or in a surface water reservoir. And I can tell you up front, this is not my favorite approach. I really prefer direct potable reuse because I think it's more controllable and actually more efficient. So we said for the source, wa source water, it has to be at least secondary treated wastewater and the goals vary. But the key, of course, as always with all water, drinking water is that it must be absolutely reliable, that the process must be effective 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It's important that there are not deviations because that can introduce some risks. Now, what's the quality of the water that can be considered to be acceptable potable reuse? It depends where you live in the United States or in the world. In, in California, uh, historically, they have required by design and operation 12 logs of virus removal from the wastewater, 10 logs of Giardia, 10 logs of Cryptosporidium removal by design. Amazingly, they are talking now about increasing this up to 21 logs of removal, if you can believe that. I think this is called overkill. Um, what about these technologies that are used in these advanced treatments? We've heard several of them already, all of these, carbon, reverse osmosis, ozone, chlorination, UV, oxidation, and even chloramines for residual purposes. Chloramines are actually quite valuable residual disinfectants, if for no other reason, they are more effective than any of these for controlling legionellosis in distribution. So they're not very wonderful disinfectants generally, 
but they're excellent at reducing the likelihood of legionellosis promulgation. So now direct portal reuse, pretty much all the same technologies, uh, perhaps some enhanced technologies, but not necessarily. But with the addition of, of a temporary engineered storage tank, that provides a simulation of what would be a uh, introduction into the environment, uh, which I think is valuable because with several hours of storage, one has a time buffer, one can perform various analyses to verify that the water that is being produced does meet all the requirements. So do we need stricter goals? I don't think so, but we need more monitoring. We need more assurance and more consistency in production. The other thing for uh, reused water is corrosion control because this water typically involves a process like reverse osmosis that will remove alkalinity and, and ionic composition, which will create very corrosive water. So it must be stabilized before it goes into the distribution system to reduce those kinds of problems that will, re will occur, like lead extraction, metal extraction, etc. It is possible, again, as in the, in the event of a serious malfunction, that one can do a diversion of the waste. One doesn't want to be 100% dependent on the recycled water, because if there is an unplanned deviation, then one can stop the introduction while the process is being improved and, and the water is being uh, uh, brought back to specification. And with these kinds of management controls and design, I think direct portable reuse is actually a better approach than indirect potable reuse because it provides total control. Because if you think about it, when you take that IPR, high quality water, put it into a surface reservoir, what do you do? Well, you recontaminate it. So you have to treat it again. So that's why I, I'm uh, very much favorable for direct potable reuse. Differences that they're similar usually over-designed, but that's good because we always want margins of safety. Public, however, has its concerns. As I say, we have right brain, left brain public. I think public intellectually can be shown that this recycled water is very high quality, but psychologically, I think sometimes there is a reluctance to accept the idea of the sewage origin, but it's as I said before, I think DPR, direct potable, is more reliable because it eliminates the need for environmental contact and potential recontamination. Uh, and so direct potable, properly done, properly managed, is safer and less costly than indirect potable. Now, the key, as always, is to assure the quality of the finished water and to have very intensive process design, demonstration in pilot, in full scale, and then validation with monitoring throughout the entire system. Typically, HACCP critical control point monitoring is a very appropriate methodology system for evaluating the process and assuring quality at every stage and at the final stage. As always, all drinking water, microbial contamination, microbial managers is by far the most significant, most important. Uh, and so obviously those designs are essential, but the key to the whole thing is, is as close to real-time monitoring as possible because there can be deviations. Uh, there are a number of, of indicator organisms and such that can be monitored, uh, E. coli, but that may take uh, 16 hours uh, plate count, which may take several days, uh, failure uh, uh, monitoring can be much quicker, a couple of hours maybe, but chlorine residual monitoring is instantaneous almost, so that's very important as part of the process. On the biological side, we know that technologies now exist to provide very detailed understanding of the composition, including next generation sequencing, DNA, RNA analyses, um, 
PCR is, of course, available for specific identifications when you know what you're looking for. But the broad, spe <clears throat> the broad spectrum systems are very important. We did a, a project on raw wastewater sewage. We found 5,000 individual uh, identifiable organisms in that. There are other rapid performance uh, indirect systems. Turbidity measurement is very good. If one is achieving low turbidity constantly, that's a high assurance of high quality water. Uh, TDS can be measured real time also, and um, pressure decay testing for membrane performance needs to be done periodically, sometimes daily, perhaps, to assure performance. Monitoring for chemicals is not so important frequently. It is important periodically to assure continued performance. We rely on the technologies to assure chemical production and chemical performance. We, of course, need to meet all regulations, but then there are some additional chemicals that need to be monitored for indication purposes, like maybe dioxane, maybe NDMA sometimes for performance verification. But very importantly, it, it is essential that an operating plant has decision rules for managing any significant quality deviations. So they need to know what the decisions will be in the event of any specific variation in quality. It is a very bad idea to inappropriately close down a plant when it isn't necessary. It is, however, important to provide compensation and decision rules that are instantaneously applicable when needed. Just a few citations, uh, some of these are older, they cover a variety of approaches uh, that deal with the concepts and the management of uh, recycled systems. So that's my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank you for your time and for your knowledge that you brought to us, Joseph. Uh, I will immediately jump into a short after panel <coughs> discussion between uh, everyone who was in here. And actually, Joseph, I would invite you to uh, ask your question that you raised to Marcos earlier in our chat, so you can you can say that. Okay. Uh, well, what I was thinking in um, in Mr. Perez's discussion was um, in the use in in um, spray irrigation, where we know there can be exposure by inhalation to workers and perhaps others in the vicinity. Um, do you have any, do you have specific requirements for the quality of sp spray irrigation water? Yeah, sure. Um, what happens is that in, here in the region, most of um, the irrigation is done uh, with uh, drip, is drip irrigation. So I don't know, I, there is no sprinkling irrigation basically. Okay, but uh, that is contemplated in the in uh, in the regulations that we have in place now. That uh, if uh, sprinkler irrigation, the quality has to be the most uh, restrictive uh, quality. Okay, less than 100 uh, E. coli, what I showed you before. But uh, most of the irrigation is done through uh, dripping uh, irrigation here. Yes. That's that's safer. We know the lungs are much more sensitive than the GI tract, so mm -hmm. it's important to be uh, uh, safe there. I'm I'm trying to remember. I think I made a comment about um, um, reducing carbon emissions, and what if what if we reduce carbon emissions to such a low level that we return to the pre-industrial revolution period when we had famous little ice age in the in the 17th century. Uh, I think it's possible. Uh, we know that uh, there's a lot of variation in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We know that a thousand years ago, the carbon dioxide levels were several times higher than they are now. And the temperatures were higher than too. We know then ultimately the cycle brought us into the little ice age. Could we reinvent the Little Ice Age if we overdo carbon emission removals? <laughs> Joseph, I would like to ask, uh, to, um, uh, to, to give an answer to your question about the sp spread irrigation. 
So in France, uh, the first uh, regulation in 2010 asked for spread irrigation to do six, uh, six months um, study to show that we what we have in uh, aerosols. And so we have a lot of research projects and a lot of uh, uh, French um, funded uh, projects about this. And um, so, uh, in fact, uh, well, um, with a um, few distances, you know, um, we have some distances in the French regulations and also in other countries, we can manage this because uh, the fact is that um, with um, the aerosol and spread irrigation, even we did, uh, you know, with um, uh, Dr. Oliveri uh, from California um, in 2000, we did uh, the um, epidemiological study and microbial risk assessment, what we can have in uh, aerosols and using uh, uh, not very good quality water, you know, secondary effluent uh, after maturation ponds. And uh, well, there is evaluated with the methods of Oliveri, it's uh, quite low. So when we have a small distances or barriers like trees or so, they are no problem. And especially, uh, for example, for urban irrigation, which is a good practice, we um, developed it, uh, we have a new ISO, uh, now starters, um, I, I work it in this, to, uh, to recommend, you know, the micro spreading, very low one and so we can manage this so uh, uh for i think that um, the risk from aerosol when we are using very tertiary disinfected influent is very low almost almost in very few very more very low and we can manage well well i hope so but but we also know that there are indications there are I, my main concern by the way is legionellosis we know that there are we situations where workers and downstream residents downstream from secondary wastewater treatment plants, especially those that practice some sort of aeration, have increased incidence of legionellosis, sometimes even a mile away downstream. So I'm, uh, I think we need to be very conf very sure, very safe when it comes to uh, spray irrigation. I agree. We had uh, such cases uh, in Europe and uh, in uh, France, and, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, the Legionella source was industrial, no wastewater treatment plant. But you know, when you have uh, water use, immediately we're looking on. In in uh, even in natural water, we have a lot of Legionella. You know, especially Legionella SPP. We have up to six log um, Legionella FCSP and natural water use it for uh, spread irrigation. Um, uh, Legionella pneumophila, which is very important one, um, it's not so, but we need more investigation. So a lot of work is needed. Could could we communicate uh, after? I'm yes, very interested yes, in any of these regulations and and such. So thanks very much. Good information. I propose rather to share uh, the presentation and uh, well uh, the um, emails because I agree that TIPSA has the best experience in irrigation. I work with them since almost ten years, and uh, I am very happy to see Josef because I work at also in California and uh, for direct and indirect portable reuse, it's very important topic. Uh, here I did not when I see your name, Josef, I did not include it. Uh, well, the comparison between the, um, uh, um, the conventional treatment using uh, biofiltration, ozonation, ultrafiltration for drinking water production compared with membrane treatment, reverse osmosis. But um, I'm convinced that, that uh, this um, more conventional treatment is much more relevant because when we are using reverse osmosis, we are removing all. And uh, now, uh, because I'm working also in desalination, the big concern about, uh, you know, the lack of some oligo elements in this uh, drinking water, because 
uh, it's uh, impossible to reconstitute uh, the content, the chemical content of the water, and especially oligo elements, in uh, especially in Middle East, where, where almost uh, 90, 95 percent of drinking water is from desalination, they had a lot of health problems. 40 percent of cancer, ca cancer here, and we are working especially with some um, expert, Nikolai Vuchkov, you know, yes. uh, from the United States, well, to see uh, what is missing, but um, it, we never can, um, can know w w w uh, this uh, natural composition. For this reason, now, when we are comparing direct uh, portable reviews, I fully agree with you, it's more safe. But uh, when we compare the membrane and more conventional technology, we need to take into account this macro on oligo elements, very, very few concentration of different um, metals and uh, inorganics that can um, are necessary for our enzyme system. Can I, can I suggest that you take that discussion at a more technical level? Um, Whenever convenient for you after the event, we will, um, as requested, do sharing of uh, materials and contacts and uh, whatever necessary. I'm glad that we got into uh, a specific area of interest. I would like to raise one question to all three of you that came from uh, one of the, uh, the persons who is uh, listening and hearing to us from uh, Miss Ilyana Ivanova. She is raising the question on, uh, and I would like to get short uh, to the point answers from all three of you, uh, what would you recommend for small agglomeration for villages, for example, be uh, below 500 people um, who live in that, for treatment of wastewater that could be good enough for irrigation purposes? I mean, I think that's quite a relevant topic for Eastern and Central Europe, where we don't have a requirement to treat the wastewater of uh, of villages, but this is where most uh, agriculture takes place. So uh, your answers are appreciated one after another. Probably, Valentina, you can start. Yes, uh, well, for small villages, we need low costly technologies. So if we have mechanical filtration, we can uh, uh, apply this filtration, you know, um, uh, or we have uh, also some uh, uh, vert uh, natural technology using filtration, so it is possible. Or even if we need a storage, maturation ponds are uh, excellent technology. So I am greatly recommending this. Thank you for that. Joseph? I agree. I think uh, heavily onto the biological, onto the sort of uh, composting of the sewage. Uh, WHO has some guidelines that they put out a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not sure they're protective against for the workers, but they probably are beneficial because I think they don't. In, they allow a certain number of helmets, for example, in the water, which is probably not so good for the workers. But um, at least it is possible to produce water that is sufficiently uh, safe for use for at least non-crop irrigation, maybe food crop irrigation too. Thank you, Marcos. Yeah, I agree with them. It's, uh, for small uh, populations uh, with uh, natural systems should be should be enough because they are more efficient uh, from the point of view of uh, their energy consumption and uh, maintenance, uh, etc. The problem is that with the new regulations in uh, the European Union, perhaps you will have problems to comply with these new regulations because they are very stringent. So um, with the natural systems, you could have problems to comply with the regulations. So uh, I think these are the best systems for these small uh, populations, but um, we have to be cautious with that because of the new regulation in Europe. Thank you for that. Actually, later today, we have an interview that I will be conducting with a person on the new urban wastewater treatment directive. So we will partially cover these topics. Although we are behind schedule, I would like to ask you all one very quick final question. Now, we covered today a variety of technologies from uh, mechanical through chemical, biological, advanced ones, etc. Uh, a general question from me is, uh, which is the technology that, even if it is in early research uh, 
pilot stages that is not conventional, not that much known. I mean, it could be anything. I mean, from ultrasound to graphene uh, technologies or etc. That you believe has the potential to disrupt wastewater treatment. Valentina, you can start. You know, we have a lot of technology called plasma and so on. Uh, well, um, the question will be the cost. In, uh, because for this plasma technology, for new technology, for example, um, plasma oxidation, uh, well, we need a specific material, so it's extremely costly. While I'm more convinced than natural technology we need to look on because, well, um, uh, we have not so much needs for direct potable reuse. Uh, first, we have to cover non-potable reuse, and for this reason, natural technology, conventional technologies are better. We need to improve biotechnology because anaerobic treatment combination, aerobic and anaerobic, can decrease energy uh, consumption and the cost. So look on such kind of solution before uh, to to go to NASA technology. Okay, clear. Point taken, uh, Joseph. I agree absolutely, uh, and you know, with with even more emphasis on direct solar exposure, uh, along with the composting approaches. Thank you. Thank you, and Marcos, your approach. Yeah, yeah sure, I agree with them because it's it's, it's funny because we here, for example, in this region. Uh, we had um, years ago, 20 years ago, we had a lot of uh, ponds, uh, you know, natural systems. And we changed all that, we removed all those and we installed this very high, uh, very, very modern um, uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant. But many times you, you can see that that wasn't, wasn't necessary because the quality of the water that, the treated wastewater that you get from uh, this natural assistance can be very, very good. So, um, and with a very little maintenance. So, uh, you know, uh, when, when they say this technology is going to generate electricity for, from water and whatever uh, these things that they say from time to time, right now I think that uh, uh, biological treatment is the, is the one that uh, we have to, to use, okay? Of course, with um, with tertiary treatments, of course, and uh, uh, perhaps ultrafiltration when it's uh, needed. But uh, you know, this is uh, the, the, I agree with them basically. Thank you. I I think it's quite important that the three of you are in agreement that uh, let's stick to nature and conventional things before we look to unconventional, new, modern, expensive, etc. So I think that's based on the fact that the three of you collectively cover uh, quite a large geographic span and different technologies for different reasons. Uh, I think our audience should have all the reasons to believe you. Thank you all. Sorry for pressing the uh, the, the panel discussion at the end, but uh, I'm trying to, to, to stick to a timetable, which I'm not actually. But uh, you get a virtual round of applause from uh, anyone who is with us and uh, uh, glad to have you in the community of water and biotechnologies. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, Thank you very much. I hope we can reconnect afterwards. Yes. You, we, we will circulate uh, contacts and all the materials that were shared with us, including links, etc., will be distributed to everyone who is in the uh, in the network of this e event, both participants, but also uh, panelists. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.